There's a story of church, in church history of a missionary who went to a city to preach the gospel. And as this missionary went, he faced extraordinary opposition. He went in and for three weeks in a row preached the word of God, uh, revealed to them the scriptures and explained and gave evidence of why Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And he had some success. There were some people who, as they heard the word of God preached, they they listened, they, they responded, they were persuaded, and they joined this missionary and his companion as they preached the word of God and the gospel. But in that community, as this missionary gained a following for his message, the people became jealous. They envied what his what was happening and the success that he was happening, the people that were following him. And so they found wicked men within the city and started a mob to chase down these believers in Jesus. And they attacked one house in particular, dragging people out into the street. This this riot took place in the city, and it was so bad that the missionary could not stay in the city any longer. After only three or four weeks of ministry in this city, he was chased out of the city to such a degree that he really couldn't ever return as much as he wanted to. And he left behind this struggling group of believers that tried to hang on to what they were taught and what was given to them before the missionary left. The missionary's name was Paul. The city was Thessalonica. A church that was born out of hardship, but born in only four weeks of gospel preaching before their missionary church planter was chased out of the city. And Paul writes back to this church in 1 Thessalonians, concerned for them. You can hear the concern of Paul if you read through the letter of 1 Thessalonians all the way through as he is worried about them. This church that he had invested only four weeks in, yes, but he was concerned that they would hang on, that they would, they would keep believing. But as the story continues, Paul talks about throughout the book of First Thessalonians their strong faith and how confident he was in this. In the first chapter, he talks about the fact that their faith was so strong that the word of God was going forth from Thessalonica in every place. Every place around them, their faith was being talked about, it says in 1 Thessalonians 1.8. In fact, it was so great that Paul didn't even need to say anything. That their faith was, was going before even he could preach the word of God. And people were curious about what had happened in Thessalonica. What was working in these people. And Paul expresses in chapter 2 his extraordinary care for them. How concerned he was for them. He, He describes himself as both a mom and a dad to these people. That he he wanted to care for them spiritually and nurture them. He also felt like sometimes he needed to correct them and direct them in the way that they should go. And finally, it says in in chapter 3 and verse 1, this, I think, just encapsulates so well how Paul felt about these people. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 1, he says, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. He said, I just couldn't take it anymore. He was only down the road, so to speak, in Athens. 
But he said, I, I had to hear. We had to help you. We had to encourage you. And I needed to hear how you were doing. So we sent Timothy. And look at what he says later on in this chapter. In, in chapter 3 and verse 6, he says, Timothy came back from them and brought us good news of your faith. This is verse 6. Good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we long to see you. And for this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith, for now we really live if you stand firm in the faith. Paul needed the encouragement to know that the church was standing firm, and he was encouraged by that. And so as he, as he articulates all of this love and care and excitement about what was happening in Thessalonica, how this church that started under such difficult circumstances was still thriving. He wanted to give them some instructions. And he does that in chapters 4 and 5. And all of, this, all of chapters 4 and 5 are encapsulated around the word sanctification. Look at chapter 4 and verse 3. This is the will of God, your sanctification. You can see later on, in chapter 5, in fact, the passage that we're talking about this morning in verse 23, you may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. So Paul is concerned about their sanctification. This is what he's most concerned about. And sanctification, just to, I've been talking about this a little bit more in a moment, but sanctification, as Paul is using it here, I believe is all of their salvation. He's talking about the entirety of their salvation. Their justification, their transformation, their glorification, all of it is what he's talking about. That's why he says, sanctify you entirely in verse 23. But again, we'll talk about that in a moment. But he's concerned about the way that they live. That there is a certain aspect of salvation that is not merely just justification, just getting out of hell, but that Salvation is something that transforms us, that grows in us, and that will be finished in us eventually. And so he talks about some issues that were on his mind in particular in regards to their sanctification. One is their sexual purity. He talks about the fact that, they, that God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification, chapter 4 and verse 7. He also wanted them to be comforted about the day of the Lord. There was some confusion in Thessalonica about the day of the Lord. They thought since they were under such persecution that perhaps they'd miss the day of the Lord. They were facing the tribulation. They were living in it as they, as they were alive in that moment. And Paul encourages them in chapter 4 in verses 13 and 18 that the dead will rise and be with Jesus. And that's a comfort for us. Even those who have been persecuted to death in Thessalonica would rise again someday and that they should live like the day of the Lord isn't already happened but that it could be tomorrow in fact he talks about that in 1 Thessalonians 5 4 through 6 when he says you're not in darkness that this day would overtake you like a thief that is the day of the Lord but you are all sons of light and sons of day we are not of night nor of darkness so then let us not sleep as others do but let us be alert and sober live like the day of the Lord is tomorrow and this is because God has destined us for this salvation, this whole salvation that he's working in us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11, the verses that precede the passage we're looking at today. He says, God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you also are doing. And so what is he, what is he, he's, he's talking about the fact that this sanctification, this salvation is grounded in the truth of the gospel, that we have been delivered from the wrath to come, and we have been saved for something, a way of life that we ought to live, that encourages one another and builds one another up. And it doesn't matter whether we are living, awake, he says, or dead, asleep, we will live together with him because God has not destined us for wrath, but for life in salvation. And this is all possible because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took the penalty for us, and he already bore the wrath of God, and so the church doesn't have to endure God's wrath. The church is delivered from God's wrath and ought to be, ought to be established in the truths 
of tra transformation and sanctification. And what this does is it just it, it lays the foundation for what is to come. When he says in verse 11, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are also doing. That one another word, whenever you see one another in the scriptures, your mind automatically ought to go to the church. That's what he's referring to. Encourage the church. Build up the church. And this idea continues on. Later on in, in the passage that we just read, he talks about live, it, live in peace with one another. More specifically, that word that we translate one another more frequently is seen in verse 15. Seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. And so as Paul is driving to this point, he's saying, listen, the church is designed for something specific. It is designed to sanctify us completely. So as he gets to verse 23 and he, and he lays out for us this prayer that God would sanctify the people of Thessalonica, the Christians in Thessalonica completely, what, he, what he's trying to establish is that this happens through the church. God is using the church to sanctify us completely. He's, he's driven at all of this one another language. He's going to talk about leaders as well early on here. And this is a letter to a church, not to an individual, but to a church. So God is using the church to sanctify us completely. And I just want to emphasize again this idea of complete sanctification. So what is he talking about when he says, now may the God of peace sanctify you entirely and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete. You see this, these words of complete and entire in here. Why does he talk about it like that? It's because we are already saved to one degree. right? We have been declared righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ, justified, delivered, saved, if you will, from the penalty of sin. But there is more to salvation than just salvation from the penalty of sin. The salvation that we have in Christ is also salvation from the power of sin in our lives. And so this is an ongoing process. We often conflate the idea of sanctification with transformation, and I don't think that that's a problem, a huge problem, but I have tried in my language to be more precise and to refer to it as our transformation as opposed to our sanctification, because I think when the Bible talks about sanctification, it's referring to this whole concept, justification, salvation from sins, penalty, transformation, salvation from sin's power, and then ultimately glorification when we are saved from sin's presence. And we're glorified in the presence of God. And so Paul is talking about this entirety. He doesn't want them only justified. He wants them transformed. And he wants them to achieve that glorification someday when they are raised from the dead, as he talks about in chapter 4. And you can have this salvation. This is for people, real people, flesh and blood, just like you and me, that God can save even you. No matter what your trouble is, no matter what your sin is, you think it's too much for God, but God can sanctify you entirely. He can preserve your spirit, soul, and body completely. That you can be without blame at the coming of Jesus Christ. Imagine this. But this is what the gospel teaches us. That the gospel is not only about getting out of hell, but about transforming the way that we think and live until we achieve the glorification that we have been called to and saved for. And so Paul outlines for us here four church-directed actions that aid our sanctification. How is it that the church sanctifies us completely? Well, it's when we submit to these four church-directed actions that our sanctification can be aided, our complete sanctification can be aided. And the first is to appreciate word-led teachers, or you could say word-taught leaders. So I think that both of these ideas are in here, that, that these, these are word-led teachers and word-taught leaders in verses 12 and 13 
We request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Note that there's a correspondence here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13 with a passage that outlines pastoral ministry in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. There, Paul writes this, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And so let me, let me point out the parallels here. You have the people who have charge over you are to, in 1 Timothy I'm sorry, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13, they're talked about those who rule well in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5. We have pastors diligently laboring in 1 Thessalonians 5. In 1 Timothy 5, it says that they work hard. And that, that idea of labor and work is the same Greek word. The, these, these are people who give you instruction in 1 Thessalonians 5. And they, they work hard at preaching and teaching in 1 Timothy 5. In 1 Thessalonians 5, we are supposed to appreciate or esteem them very highly. In, chapter, in 1 Timothy 5, we are told to consider them worthy of double honor. And, and we just need to recognize that when it talks about elders in 1 Timothy 5.17, it's talking about pastors. Elder is not a special separate office from pastor in the church, but pastors are elders, elders are pastors, and they're also referred to as overseers in the scripture. The clearest point where this is all brought together is in Acts chapter 20, in verses 17 through 28. I'm not going to read all of it, but in Acts chapter 20, in verse 17, Paul meets with the elders of Ephesus. And as he meets with the elders of Ephesus, he gives them some instruction. And, and in verse 28, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his blood. So he's talking to elders, and he tells them to oversee. That's, the, that's uh, one of the words that's talked about for pastor, especially 1 Timothy 3, if anyone desires the office of overseer. Some, some translations, especially older translations, will translate that bishop. So there's an overseer, but there's also a shepherd. He, there's to shepherd the church of God. That's the word for pastor there in Acts 20, 28. So he says, oversee the flock and pastor the flock, you elders. So elders are pastors are bishops are pastors or elders are bishop. Like these are all the same. When the Bible talks about these terms, he's talking about the same thing. It's talking about the same thing. And so here, in 1 Thessalonians 5, what he's telling us is that these people who act like this and, and serve in this way are worthy of appreciation and esteem. And by the way, this laboring, this diligent labor of pastors is connected to their teaching ministry here. In fact, so is their charge over us and the rule in 1 Timothy 5. It's all connected to their teaching ministry. Pastors have no authority beyond the word of God. Now, you can, you can pay attention to what Pastor Nate or I say if we're talking about same, some budget matter. You know, we're, gonna, we're talking about remodeling the kitchen potentially this summer. As we talk about that, we can have an opinion about it. We're human beings and we have opinions. But our opinion doesn't matter more than your opinion on something like remodeling the kitchen. In fact, in some cases, some of your opinions ought to matter a lot more than mine because I have exactly zero experience in remodeling a kitchen. Some of you may have more. But I'm not worried about that because I'm not, I, that's not my thing. I'm a pastor. This is my thing. I study the Word of God. I preach the Word of God. And so as I preach the Word of God and it aligns with the Word of God, you should listen to me. I have leadership over you with regard to the Word of God, not with regard to whether or not we remodel the kitchen. And so this is the pastor's authority. It's not telling the church what to do. It's leading the church in what the scriptures say and guiding you to wisdom. It is, as, we, as it says in Ephesians 4, it is equipping the saints for the work of ministry that you can do the work of ministry. You can build up the body of Christ. And so if I say, hey, your life isn't matching up with this, or this is what the word of God says that we ought to, how we ought to live, then there is additional authority that I have, especially as I 
labor in the word, as I diligently labor in the word and give you instruction, or as I, as I preach and teach the word, as it says in 1 Timothy 5. And so let's emphasize what's not here. What's not here is that you appreciate the pastor or the guy with the greatest personality or is the, the guy with the, who's the greatest showman up front or the guy who can draw a big crowd. It doesn't say appreciate that guy. It doesn't say appreciate those who know the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership and, and execute them efficiently and effectively. It doesn't say appreciate those who water down the word and soften the word's edges. Sometimes pastors have to say what stings a little. It doesn't say appreciate those who have no character. I think the character is implied in this passage when it talks about the fact that they diligently labor and they know the word of God giving you instruction. It's also not saying that the pastor has charge over everybody and gets to call all the shots. And let me also add that it's not defending any sort of pastoral abuse. It's not a touch, not the Lord's anointed kind of esteem or appreciation. It's just appreciate the fact that someone is investing in the Word of God to help equip you for the work of ministry. Love them. But then there's, there's a second thing. And that is, not, it's not only that we should appreciate Word-led teachers or Word-taught leaders, but also that we should seek Good driven discipleship. Seek good driven discipleship. So he says, We urge you, brethren. He actually says in the verse before that, he says, Be at peace with everyone. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one repays another evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. So, what are we after here in this passage? We're after good. Good for people. Good for each other. And this is what we're driving at. This is what the church is for. It is for the good of the flock. It is for the good of the people of God. And we're supposed to pursue that good in each other. So you have a responsibility within the church of Jesus Christ to pursue the good in all of the other people who are part of the church. So you have a responsibility to pursue good in me. And you have a responsibility to pursue good in the person sitting next to you or down the row or three rows in front of you or wherever in this congregation. You have a responsibility to seek the good of the church. And that's the people of the church. And the only way we can do that is if we have a formal commitment to each other. And so I'm not going to wax eloquent on membership, but I think that this sort of demands that we know who's in and who's out. Who are we, have, who are we responsible for? Who do we care for? Well, it's the membership in particular of our local church. Yes, you can have influence on other Christians, sure, but your primary responsibility is to seek the good of Liberty Baptist Church. And the people here investing in each other and blessing each other with spiritual growth. And to do that, we must know each other. We have to know each other. We have to invest in each other's lives. And, and he talks about some ways in which we do that here. He says, first of all, that we need to admonish the unruly. So this is a sort of warning that we give to people who are, who are heading towards sin. That word unruly is really complicated. You might have a translation that translates it idle. Um, some undisciplined, some unruly. It's only used one time in the entire New Testament, so we're kind of guessing a little bit as to what the drive behind uh, Paul's use of this word is here. But I think we could just understand it as those who are heading towards sin. The people who are, are making bad decisions in their lives need some warning. You're heading a wrong way. Your life isn't consistent with the truth of Scripture. That book that I, that I uh, referenced during the prayer of petition is, um, has a great chapter on fellowship of the church. I highly recommend it. Um, and it's free on Desiring God's website, by the way, as a digital book. So you don't even need to get a, buy a physical copy. You can read it for free. But I I'm going to quote him a couple times, a couple more times. I just really appreciated what David Mathis had to say about this. And so when we're, when we're correcting each other, 
How, what is it supposed to look like? The charge, he says, the charge lands not on the drifting saint to get himself back on the path, but on the others in the community to have enough proximity to him, awareness of him, and regularity with him to spot the drift and war with him and for him against the sin. This means of grace, then, in such a circumstance has a unique function in the Christian life. It is not laid on the spiritually weak to muster their will and do the discipline, but it is for the body to take up discipline on the behalf of the wanderer to mediate grace to the struggler, to preempt apostasy by putting words of truth and grace into his open ear hole and praying for the Spirit to make them live. End of quote. We have a responsibility to intervene in each other's lives when we're going the wrong way. We often, we have this idea in American culture that we're supposed to just like, let's just stand back, let's just kind of see what happens. And I do this too. We can't do that. We need to intervene, we need to care enough about each other and invest in each other's lives that we can see the drift and warn each other. But it's not even just warning each other about drift, it's also encouraging each other when we're about to quit. Here again, David Mathis says, Fellowship may save your life in the dark night of your soul. As you pass through the valley of the shadow of death and the shepherd comforts you with his staff, you will discover that he has fashioned his people to act as his rod of rescue. When the desire to avail yourself of hearing his voice in the word has dried up, and when your spiritual energy is gone to speak into his ear, God sends his body to bring you back. It is typically not the wanderer's own efforts, efforts that prompt his return to the fold, but his brothers, James 5, 19 through 20, being to him a priceless means of God's grace, the invaluable backstop, end of quote. So you see this responsibility that we have. Admonish the unruly, Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, holding up those who can't hold up themselves. And, and all of this will result in us living at peace with one another. Notice he says, don't, this isn't about revenge against people. It's not repaying evil for evil, but it's seeking what's good for people. We're supposed to be patient with everyone. Good luck with that. But this is what we're called to. Colossians chapter 3 and verses 12 through 13, Paul says, As those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against another, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. You see, when we operate in this realm as Christians, we're going, to have, we're going to rub each other the wrong way sometimes, but we need to be patient with each other. When someone reprimands you or warns you and you don't take it the wrong way, be humble, receive it, listen to it, contemplate it, and if they're right, change, and if they're wrong, then you can ignore them. But don't, it's not about revenge, it's not about, oh, you found something in me, well, I'm going to start analyzing your life and try to find something in, that's wrong with you. No, this is about the good of the body. It's about building each other up and helping each other grow. And this is what we're supposed to look like. This is what the church is for. This is how God sanctifies us. He brings you into my life to speak truth to me. And he brings me into your life to speak truth to you so that you can be like Jesus. But we have to know each other. We have to invest in each other. We have to spend time together. And we have to be willing to say the hard things sometimes. Or even sometimes just say the easy thing. Like, the Bible is true, the gospel is real, and God loves you to somebody who's about to quit. The third church-directed action is found in verses 16 through 18. It is God-expected worship. Join God-expected worship. I, I say it's God-expected because he says this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Just, I think these are worship terms. I think he's talking about the worship of the church. Invest in the worship of the church. Join it. Be a part of it. When he says rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything gives thanks, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He's talking about the worship of the church. This is not, I know we apply this to our individual lives, and it's good for us to do that. You should rejoice in your life. You should pray often in your life. You should you should give thanks often in your life. All of these things should mark us all the time in our lives. But I think he's partic particularly talking about the gathering of the church here. And by the way, 
This just struck me last night as I was preparing for this, that this kind of follows the outline for our worship service. Praise God, rejoice always. Prayer, pray without ceasing. Do we pray enough in our service? We, pray, we have like five public prayers in our worship services. And give thanks to God. We have a time of thanksgiving in our worship services. This is like, we follow this outline that Paul is outlining for us here. And then we end it with revelation, the preaching of the word of God, looking at the truth of scripture. And by the way, Paul's going to get to that in a moment. I just didn't include it with the join God expected worship. But notice as well what's interesting about all of these verses. Always. Without ceasing. In everything. You see how all-encompassing this is supposed to be? This is supposed to be what marks us as a church. That we are worshiping together. We are praising God. We are praying to God. And we are thanking God. And we are hearing his word. This is the, these are the things that we ought to mark us as the people of God. When we worship together. Join with the church in worship. It is an indispensable part of who we are as the church. And the sanctification that God is trying to work in us. And that leads into the revelation part which is the very last of our church-directed actions, that we obey spirit-inspired revelation. That we obey spirit-inspired revelation. So, he's, so he ends with this, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to which is, that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now I think he's just talking about the word of God here for us. You've got to understand though, in the first century they didn't have a Bible, They needed prophets. They had prophets who spoke in the church. And they would give what the word, they would speak the words of God in the church. And then pastors would teach based on the revelation of God that was given. And one commentator pointed out that what Paul is telling them to do here is as they listen to the prophets, they should avoid cynicism. So don't quench the spirit and don't despise prophetic utterances. He's saying... Listen, God is revealing himself. Believe that he's doing so and listen to him as he does. Don't be a skeptic about everything. Don't assume that every prophet is up there just trying to make a name for themselves or trying to, uh, trying to be oppressive in your life. But then also avoid being gullible. So you, you avoid cynicism, avoid, being, avoid qu- overly questioning everything, but also avoid being gullible. You've got to also examine everything carefully and hold to what is good and abstain from evil. I think it's interesting that prophecy here is connected to abstaining from every form of evil. Every time you read about false teacher warnings in the New Testament, it's connected to immorality. False prophets will always promote immorality. And so Paul's saying... Don't get duped by the people who are saying, oh, it's okay for you to live your life any old way you want. That's a false prophet. A true prophet says God has demands on your life and you should live this way. And so listen to the word of God and obey it. But we do have, we don't have prophets in our church. We have the scriptures in our church. We don't need a prophet anymore. We've got the Bible. And so Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, that whenever the whenever they come together, they sh- that he should give attention to the public reading of Scripture and to exhortation and teaching. And so because we have this Spirit-inspired revelation, it may be in a different form than they had it in Thessalonica, but we have the same Spirit-inspired revelation. We should read it, we should listen to it, and we should obey it. This is what, this is what the Scriptures are calling us to here. This is the worship of God's church. And so we see that the church is God's sanctifying grace for all of us. God puts us here. God has put you here in this, among this group of people at Liberty Baptist Church so that you can grow spiritually. You can be sanctified completely. And the best part is in verse 24. After Paul prays this for them, that they would be sanctified completely, notice what he says in verse 24. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. what, What great news. That God is going to bring about my sanctification 
through the church that he's ordained for this age. It is guaranteed, just like Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. I say the same thing. I am confident of this very thing, that Jesus Christ is going to change you as you submit to the church and let the word of God work in your life and the spirit of God change you God is going to do this work in us and he's using his church to accomplish it. He's using all of us together to grow all of us together into the image of Jesus Christ. Um, On your bulletins this morning, there's this crazy looking image. This is an AI generated image. But I, when, when I put in the prompt and this came out, I said, This is a beautiful picture of what the church ought to be. It is all of us growing up together to help each other grow up together. And God is working in our lives to to accomplish this in our lives. And so invest in the church. This is what God is using in this day and age to change you and to change me. And he wants to keep changing us. He's ordained it. It is his will, he says in 1 Thessalonians 4. So let the will of God be accomplished in your life by investing in the church. Don't be the kind of person who just comes to church on Sunday and zips out the door as quick as you can. Know each other. Invest in each other. Talk to each other. Invest outside of worship services as well. Bless each other. Help each other grow. And when you need it, admonish each other. When you need it, encourage each other. And when you need it, help each other. And let us, let us all grow up together. Let us be the church that we have been called to be. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says that every individual part is, is providing what is needed for the growth of the body. That means you and me and the person next to you and down the row and in the rows in front of you and around you. Every single one of us, God is using to help grow this body to look like Jesus. And so let it be by being here, by investing here. This is where all of salvation is found. We have the truth of the gospel and we are helping each other grow in transformation. May God be glorified to do that at Liberty Baptist Church as we continue serving him in the years to come. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth and thank you for the word of God and the gospel that is transformative in our lives. I pray that you would bless Liberty Baptist Church, that you would open our eyes to what you have called us to be as the church of Jesus Christ, that we would not be lazy or take for granted these relationships, but that we would invest in them, that we would be the church that you've called us to be, and that all of us would be growing together so that we would help each other grow together in Christ, and that we would be the church that you've called us to be in this world, in this city that needs to hear about Jesus and needs to see the amazing work that you can do in building up a body that is transformative in our world. Thank you for this opportunity. Be glorified as you bless Liberty Baptist Church and continue to help it grow in the future. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.